All right, thanks, uh, Christopher. So, um, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Tim Wright. I'm the Media Past President of the AADR. AADR is going to be hosting a series of webinars on topics related to COVID-19, uh, and we will, if you want information about the series and how to, to register for the others, you can go to the website, which I've actually pasted uh, the website address into the chat. Uh, function on here for your convenience, so you can go there and look. Um, if you would like to receive ABA continuing edu education credit for this webinar, you need to make note of the code that will appear at the end of the webinar and then complete the survey for the ABA um, CERP credit. Uh, be sure and register for the full series of webinars. The next one will be next uh, Wednesday, June 29th. And the topic will be COVID-19 research questions and our practice from the Wuhan experience. And that'll be presented by Dr. Zuan Bian uh, from Wuhan University in China. And that, that should be very interesting. So please join us again. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties using the WebEx chat window, uh, you can use the WebEx chat window and message the IDR global headquarters. Uh, the chat window is the little bubble, speech bubble at the bottom. So click on that. And if you're having issues with that, if you can't see that, you can go to the IADR.org website and the IADR staff will address your questions and give you assistance to help get you back into the webinar so you can see it if you're having, having issues. So go, go to the chat, post it there, or go to the IADR.org website. Um, the WebEx chat window is also how we're going to be doing our questions and answers uh, today. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please pop them into the chat. Um, make sure that it says all panelists and just type in right below that, which right now you'll see that it's occupied, that space is occupied with the uh, webinar address um, or the ID or site for the webinars. So you can just put your questions in there. We will be holding all questions till the end of the presentation uh, and having a discussion at the at the end of this. So it's a real pleasure for me uh, to welcome Dr. Jennifer Webster Syriac, who's a friend and a colleague of mine. She's a professor in the Division of Oral and Craniofacial Sciences and in the Division of Surgical and Craniofacial Care at the University of North Carolina Adams School of Dentistry. She's also a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at UNC School of Medicine. And she serves as the director of the Viral Oral Infections Immunosuppression and Cancer Program there. She received her DDS from the State University of New York at Buffalo and her PhD in Microbiology and Immunology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on maxillofacial and oral diseases and immunocompromised individuals. Uh, Dr. Syriac has been uh, continued her oral disease pathogenesis studies and broader context of infectious disease over the last two decades. And she's maintained clinical activity that is also primarily focused on medically complex populations, including HIV and cancer. So it's a real pleasure for me to welcome our first uh, speaker in the, the webinar series, Dr. Jennifer Webster Syria. So Jennifer, thanks for, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. I'm going to just share my screen and thank you so much for that great introduction. Let's make sure. Okay. Are you able to see it? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. It's coming now. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. This has been an interesting time, hasn't it, for, for all of us, given uh, that our world has been upended. But before we start, I'll just share that I have no financial disclosures and that the objectives for today are to understand the known oral and systemic impacts of COVID-19, also known as SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and to also understand the relationship between this zoonotic infection and the development of this pandemic. This is the problem, okay? It's this tiny thing that we cannot see that has upended our world, okay? How best to address a problem, perhaps 
the SWOT analysis, okay? From our standpoint as oral health practitioners and dental researchers, in my view, there are strengths. As oral health researchers and practitioners, we can make a significant contribution because we understand what's occurring in the oral cavity, and this is a major region of replication and transmission for this virus. In terms of weaknesses, right now they're knowledge gaps, and these are real opportunities for us in our field. Additional opportunities are oral testing and diagnostics, which are much less invasive than the current uh, standard of care, prognostics, and the potential to decrease local viral burden and diminish transmission. Then of course, threats are transmission and infection, both on working with this virus and with working with people. So what do we know? We know that the outbreak was first reported on December 12th in 2019 in Wuhan, China. And early on, they were saying this was related to a seafood market. Today, there are only about three countries in the world that haven't reported any cases. The median age is, is middle-aged, 47 to 59 years old, with about 45% of patients being female. So more males than females. And due to this widespread and rapid growth of the infection, the WHO declared this global outbreak as a card carrying pandemic. So if we look at where we are globally, in the upper left hand corner here, you can see everybody in the entire world with the exception of these three places in yellow have reported cases, okay? And if we look at the situation, and this is was this was as of July 20th, okay? You can actually see we're at about 14, over 14 million cases, and now we're well over 15, okay? But in the parentheses, you can see the number of new cases within a 24 hour period. And so as of Monday, within 24, from Sunday to Monday, 5,000 more deaths globally. The other thing that's really clear is that the Americas are leading the charge, both in terms of cases and in terms of deaths. If we look at what's happening in the United States, again, this data is uh, two days old. What you can see is that our case numbers have continued to climb. We had a small plateau late May, but we've continued to, we've continued to rise, okay? Uh, up here are the reported cases with higher, ca higher cases with a darker color. So you can see this very clear belt along the Southeast um, and numbers of deaths. Um, again, more in the Southeast United States. And in fact, the Southern United States is now really the epicenter of the global epidemic. It's interesting because in the US, we're about 4% or 4.5% of the global population, but we're about 25% of the cases. So that's a significant disparity um, with us having, moving towards 4 million cases and towards 150,000 deaths. And what's interesting is as the epidemic has progressed, and now this slide is a little bit old, um, this is a slide I borrowed from the NIH, you can actually see that the distribution of the virus is well aligned with social and economic disparities, okay? And so when you look at, you can see here across the Southern United States and up the Eastern seaboard, but when you look at HIV, the distribution's pretty, oops, the distribution is pretty similar, okay? So vulnerable populations are those that get infected with HIV and vulnerable populations are predisposed to COVID-19 infection. So where does it actually begin? Of course, we know it began in Asia and then became a global pandemic, but where did the virus come from? Well, we know that this is a zoonotic pandemic, which means it came from an animal. And there are basically three stages to zoonotic pandemics. There's a pre-emergent stage and 
you know, we and Al Gore was way ahead on this all those years ago, talking about, um, you know, being being kind to the planet, okay, and to maintain biodiversity. So what occurs is when you're encroaching on a wildlife habitat or changing the the land use you see a difference in the exchange of microbes between the different animal reservoirs. The changes to the ecology can actually then change the transmission dynamics. And so you have a higher risk of a pathogen spilling over from one non-human host to another non-human host, okay? After pre-emergence, we see a localized emergence. And so this occurs at that wildlife-human interface where these human adapted viruses are now introduced through zoonotic transmission from animal reservoirs to humans. Um, and then what you'll see is a localized increase in numbers of person to person transmission. And this was outlined very clearly in the Ebola outbreak as well as the Nipah pandemic where the Ebola was highly concentrated in specific regions of Africa. And once you move beyond the localized emergence, in this case at Wuhan, China, you move towards the emergence of a pandemic. And this is facilitated by international travel and trade. We are a global society, okay? And we've seen this now with three pandemics, with the first SARS, with HIV, and now with COVID-19. The urgency of our understanding this goes beyond COVID-19. And it's really an opportunity for us to grasp what's happening and try to promote some balance within the world so that this will not continue. Um, and this was the genesis of the Global Virome Project in 2018. Um, we know that there are about 260 animal-borne viruses that infect humans, but there are about 1.7 million unidentified viruses that are thought to exist in mammals and water birds, okay? So those of those million viruses, there may be some of those that are maybe even more lethal and disruptive than COVID-19. So again, it is urgent that we can actually utilize co our experience with COVID-19 to try to diminish this in the future, okay? Why do I think there's gonna, this is gonna happen again? Not just because there's so many additional viruses in these other reservoirs, but and that things like land use and biodiversity are being modulated. But if we look over time, we've seen an increase in the frequency of viruses that jump from animals to people. And so here you can see, if we look over the past 50 years, okay, where there was the Marburg epidemic and there was an earlier uh, Ebola epidemic in 1976. But what you can see is over time, we can see the epidemics are getting closer and closer together, okay? There wasn't even an epidemic in the 80s, okay, skipped. But look at what's happening from in the past 10 years for epidemics, okay? So this is really increasing pretty significantly, okay? This slide was from earlier in January. Um, so this is not true. These numbers are not true in terms of the fatality rate, the number of countries, and of course, the numbers of cases and deaths. As we know, we're more like close to 15 million right now, okay? So we know that, so SARS-CoV-2 is one of eight known beta coronaviruses, okay? And most of these, their natural reservoir is in bats and or rodents, okay? Some of them have an intermediate hosts. These include camels, cows, pigs, and others. And many, several of them are only really cause mild infection. And that includes the human coronaviruses um, that are numbered, okay? 
like human coronavirus 43, for example, okay? But the MERS, which is the Middle, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus and the earlier SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Virus, as well as our current COVID-19, all cause severe infection, okay? How do we know that this COVID-19 is a beta, a beta coronavirus? Because when we actually look at a phylogenetic tree of the known coronaviruses, here are the beta viruses, and you can see it aligns very closely in terms of its genomic similarity to the beta coronaviruses on the tree. The other thing um, that is now a question is whether there is actually an intermediate host uh, for this virus and is thought to potentially be the civet, okay? SARS coronavirus does come from bats, okay? But people, it's interesting, lay people just don't think that people are making that up, but it's true. Coronaviruses in general are naturally hosted and developmentally, form, developmentally formed by bats. And here in this phylogenetic tree, in the blue are bat coronavirus sequences, okay? In the green is a civet sequence, the potential intermediary host. And in the red are the human sequences, okay? The human sequences are about 96% identical to that of the bat, okay? And one other important measure of proof is that if you actually take the bat viruses, they can utilize the human ACE2 receptor for entry and pathogenesis, okay? So it's very clear that there's a relationship between the bat coronavirus and it's likely that it jumped into the human population potentially through the civet. Now these viruses are enveloped positive strand RNA viruses. And as I showed you, just based on the intermediaries, they can infect a lot of different animals. This severe acute respiratory syndrome virus is a single-stranded virus. It can be up to 150 nanometers, okay? And of course, it's the etiologic agent of COVID-19. And when you look at the virus under the electron microscope, you can see these spikes that form a crown. And this is why these are named coronavirus. So these, these crowns and the spiked crown is actually pathognomonic for coronaviruses, this crown-like uh, appearance from the spike glycoproteins. Um, but when you look at the coronavirus, this coronavirus is actually quite identity there is about in the 70%, 70 to 79%. And then the Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome virus, in terms of identity, it's only about 50%. So it's a different beast. Here's what it looks like, okay? So it has an RNA genome depicted here in blue. It's surrounded by a lipid bilayer, and it has four structural proteins that include the nucleocapsid, the membrane protein, the envelope protein, and the spike. So it's about 25% RNA viruses. I shared with you the structural proteins. Three of them, the spike envelope and membrane, are glycoproteins. The nucleocapsid is not. Excuse me. Excuse me. There are actually 16 non-structural proteins. Um, so for an RNA virus, this has quite a few proteins. And these 16 non-structural proteins come from two polypeptides, orphan A and B, okay? And so these long polypeptides are cleaved by a viral protease. Um, and these non-structural proteins um, also 
to evade host immune responses, particularly this one, NSP3, okay? Now, in addition to the structural proteins and the non-structural proteins, there are also nine accessory proteins. And they're called accessory because you don't really need them to replicate, okay? But they are really important to immune evasion. So what does, just like any virus, okay, a virus is an obligate intracellular pathogen and parasite. The virus by itself can't do anything. It needs to be inside of a host cell, okay? And it's, what does it want to do? It wants to make more of itself, okay? That is its passion. And that's what this one actually has done quite effectively, okay? But in order to do it well, you've got to be... So what happens, and this is a busy slide, but what happens when the virus comes into contact with the host, okay? The first thing that happens is the spike protein binds to the receptor. The receptor is ACE2, okay? And upon binding, two different things can happen. It can either become endocytosed, okay? And then the spike protein can activate fusion by fusion with the endosomal membrane um, utilizing the cystepsin. Once it binds, once the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor, the binding could expose a cleavage site. And then this cleavage site can be clipped by furin or by other proteases like TMPRSS2. That's at very high levels on the mouth, particularly in the tongue. Uh, and there are many proteases, like the, there are many other related TTSPs that are also expressed in the oral cavity. So once this virus has bound an endocytosed, uncoding occurs, okay, so the virus sheds its outer shell and the viral genome is then released into the cytoplasm. So this virus doesn't even need to go into the nucleus to replicate, okay? That virus, and here shown by the, the green here, okay, this is the viral genome. And, okay, this is now used by a template. The virus encodes its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, then sucks up a number of other cellular proteins like RNA binding proteins and others, be replicated and translated such that proteins can be made. One other thing the virus has evolved to do is the S protein as it's being made, it's being made through the secretory pathways, okay? And goes through the trans-Golgi network. Well, while in the trans-Golgi network, there are intracellular proteases that are present, including furin. And so what this does is allows for an intracellular activation, okay? So some of these S proteins are pre-cleaved. Now they're activated and they're prone. The virus is released to now go out and infect other cells without necessarily having to go through this, through this system, okay? So you can see that the virus has evolved a number of things to take advantage of the cell but without the host cell, nothing can occur. Now, what's the problem with this and other, infect and other viral infections? These same proteins that the virus is using to make more of itself, we need to be successful for, the cell for our cells to be successful and to live, okay? So that becomes a major challenge, particularly as we think about potential targets. Okay. All right. So, like I said, the virus really needs to use a lot of um, cellular proteins in order to be successful. And included in these are RNA binding proteins. 
as an RNA virus in order to move towards um, replication and translation, this makes sense. Um, so the virus is basically stealing these RNA binding proteins from the host, and this can result then in altered host transcriptional regulation for host proteins. That is a major issue for the host. And of the proteins that are made by the virus, 13 of them are predicted to directly interact with over 50 human RNA binding proteins, as well as multiple miRNAs, okay, these microRNAs. And so actually in this violin plot over here, you can actually see preferential binding of our RBP motifs across. So this is the SARS genome, okay? These are um, proteins that have RBP motifs, and you can see that the frequency is actually quite high, okay? Many of these um, human RBPs that are directly interact with, um, co with COVID predictions that are predicted to interact are abundantly expressed in immune cells, okay? So what else happens? So we know what happens to the virus. What about when the virus comes into contact with the host? What difference does it make to the host cell, okay? Well, so we just went through the viral life cycle, okay? And once the virus gets in there, just the presence of the virus often results in host DNA damage. Um, and that is intentional because viruses can then utilize some of the, uh, the, bait, the nucleotides and other things important um, for the host. It can now use it for itself, okay? So you have activation of host DNA damage responses. In addition, once the virus gets in, the cell senses something's gone wrong, okay? Um, and it senses this utilizing these pathogen recognition receptors. Activation of those PRRs actually results in the activation of a number of caspase pathways that then result in guest dermin mediated pyroptosis. The pyroptosis leads to cytokine release and cell death, okay? And you also get activation of damps uh, or damage associated molecular patterns. And these stimulate additional inflammation. So this is inflammation that's occurring because the cell's not doing well, not which is different than the, inf the innate immune responses that are stimulated because of detection of the pathogen, okay? So it's a one-two punch, okay? So you've now got viral antigens and cellular debris. Upon, um, once the cell has been infected, because these cells then die, and this results to in more inflammation and coagulation dysfunction. So the consequences to the cell are dire. Once these things are released, this then is taken up by a number of immune cells and that's what really promotes the inflammation. So you have, in terms of the cell, robust recruitment and engagement of the cellular immune responses. So these are lung cells and this is on a Nature Review article from Abraham uh, and in these lung cells, you've got a macrophage, okay? Just like in our oral epithelial cells, we have traffic, we've got resident macrophage as well, okay? What happens upon the infection, the innate immune system is primed to secrete a number of different cytokines and chemokines, including IL-6, IP-10, MYP1-alpha, and beta, MCP, okay? Um, and of course, a critical response to many viral infections, innate response is activation of interferon pathways. This then says, come on guys, we've got a problem over here. So T cells, macrophages, monocytes, come help me with this infection, okay? So you're 
engaging. So first you have the innate immune response activated, and then you have this robust recruitment and engagement of cellular immune responses, okay? And this is okay. This is okay if you've got a functional immune response, mm -hmm. if you're on the healthy side. Why? Because you can have clearance of the infected cells. Macrophages will come and clear the neutralized virus. The antibodies will be good and they will actually be neutralizing. They'll, and because they're neutralizing, they will inactivate the virus, okay? Those pyroptotic cells or apoptotic cells will be recognized by macrophages. They'll be phagocytosed and taken up. Taken up. There'll be the initiation of efficient immune responses in terms of the cytotoxic T cell response, TCL response. And eventually you'll get the eight T cells made that facilitate a memory response and they will come in and clean up and eliminate infected cells. So if you've got a functional immune system, you're gonna have minimal inflammation, you have minimal organ damage, you're gonna clear it up. And this is what's happening in the asymptomatic people, okay? But what about when you don't have a, a functional immune response? When you don't have a functional immune response and you've had the release of these um, innate immune factors, you'll then have enhanced vascular permeability. You're gonna, your immune system's gonna get in there and try to do what it can, um, but this excessive infiltration of monocytes, macrophages, and T cells will eventually result in a systemic cytokine storm. From the standpoint of the lungs, you're gonna get pulmonary edema and pneumonias. This is gonna cause widespread inflammation. You'll have elevated levels of multiple cytokines and chemokines, including IL-1 beta, IL-1 receptor antigen, IL-7, 8, 9, 10. So there are a bunch of them, MCP1, all these pro-inflammatory cytokines that'll be activated, multi-organ damage. And if you've got a really severe infection, you're gonna have even more, including IL-2, IL-7, IL-10, IP-10, MCP1, MYP1-alpha, and TNF. And all of these things make the disease worse. This is why you get the multi-organ multi damage. The other thing that happens when you don't have a very functional immune response is that your antibodies may not work that well and they may not actually neutralize the virus. So what happens then is this then actually flips the script and you can get an antibody dependent enhancement that actually facilitates entry of the virus into cells and can even facilitate replication. So it just makes it worse. So what do we think is happening, okay? What's been proposed is that upon initial infection, there's a short-term, uh, let's call it pre-symptomatic slash asymptomatic state where the virus is ramping up and it's binding the mucosal epithelia through interactions with ACE2 and TRMPPS2 receptors, both in the nasal cavity, upper respiratory tract, and likely the oral cavity, okay? And you have local propagation within these um, areas with limited innate immune responses. And it's at this time, people will start to lose their senses related to taste and to smell, okay? The virus is then thought to pass through the mucosal membranes and then enter the lungs through the respiratory tract, okay? But during this time, if we look at the red line, the amount of virus is increasing over time, okay? As you move towards stage two, you have propagation down the respiratory tract and even more robust innate immune responses, okay? And so then you peak in terms of your viral replication, okay? Your inflammation continues to go up, okay? As does D-dimer, which is an indicator of this inflammation. And what you'll see is enhanced interferon responses and interferon responsive genes, including CXCL10. 
And as you move in towards this uh, lung infection, you'll see that the human alveolar cells become infected with the virus. And once the virus is in the lungs, it's thought that the peripheral blood can carry the virus from the blood, from the lungs into the blood and you get viremia, okay? And this is now gonna bring the virus to the gut and to the intestines, okay? And this is why you can actually detect the virus in the stool. And so it's thought the median time to symptom onset can be up to eight days for some patients. And so when it's early on, your white blood cells are normal or you have a little bit of lymphopenia uh, as those cells are now working to get to, out of the bloodstream and to the places where the virus are so they can try to fight the infection. The other thing that you'll see during stage two, during this acute, acute phase, um, you may have pneumonias. You'll also see an increase in IL-6, okay? And then when people move to severe infection, and about 20% of people are thought to progress to this stage where they've got significant pulmonary infiltrates, they develop severe disease, and, and the disease, of course, can be fatal. And of course, the fatality really varies based on how old people are and whether they have any other existing comorbidities. The virus at that point, is doing a, a, doing a significant job on type two alveolar cells. And actually here's a, an electron micrograph, one of these type two alveolar cells, and you can see all this virus in there, okay? The other thing that you see is disseminated intravascular coagulation problems with this leaky, with the leaky vessels that we just talked about uh, and high levels of D-dimer. How do patients present? There was a study done mostly in the UK, but they included people from the UK and the US. Um, and they had, um, and I think this is King's College, they utilized a real-time tracking of self-reported symptoms in an app, okay? And so between March and April of this past year, there were over 2 million people from the UK and under 200,000 from the U.S. And about 32% of patients in the U.K. indicated having at least one or more potential symptoms of COVID-19. Of all of these over 2 million patients, about almost 20,000 had a test, had a COVID test. And the proportion of participants who had reported loss of smell was, was much higher in those people who had a positive test. It was like 65% versus those that had a negative test result, okay? So your odds risk of actually having the virus and losing your smell is like 6.74%, okay? And so if we look over here at the odds risk of being infected, we, we the world, we're really using fever as our main uh, as a main potential red flag. The odds risk of being infected and having fever in the U.S. not very high, just over one. Uh, and then if you're in the U.K., maybe approaching two. But look at loss of smell. Loss of smell. The odds risk goes up to about almost 11 times in the UK and about, oh, in the US and about seven over, between six and seven times in the UK, okay? So sense of smell, loss of smell and or taste seems to be a much better indicator of whether there's an active infection um, compared to fever. And so they were able to then develop a model combining the symptoms to predict whether there was probable infection because the majority of people who had gone and done the app study actually had not had a test, okay? So when they applied the data from the model to all app users who reported symptoms, it looked 
17.4% of the participants were likely to have COVID-19, which is actually really high. So how do patients present? How do they come in? They really, based on um, this large sample size, they were able to determine that there were six major clusters. So no fever, okay? That includes headache, loss of smell, muscle pains, cough, sore throat, chest pain, no fever. Flu-like with the fever, gastrointestinal, okay? Here you're gonna have, in addition to headache, loss of smell, uh, there'll also be diarrhea together with the sore throat and chest pain. There's, and then there's severe level one where the person is just really tired okay, and they have significant fatigue. Level two, um, in addition to their headache and the other symptoms, there'll be confusion. And level three includes abdominal and respiratory um, symptoms that include shortness of breath, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. So six major clusters and people will present differently, okay? The other thing they, they found were that there were skin changes, which really isn't even in that rubric. So there were 694 who were positive to SARS by a swab or antibody test um, in this particular study. And what they found were that a bunch of them had skin changes at the same time as the COVID-19 symptoms. So up to 47% of them. 35% of them had skin changes after the other symptoms went away. Um, and in 21% of them, skin changes were the only symptom. Okay, not smell, not chest pain, not fever, none of that stuff, only skin changes. And the skin changes included rashes uh, that were afro rashes, papular rashes, those were present at the most at the highest frequencies and then urticaria. Okay, so something for us to consider um, when patient when we're interfacing with our patients. Okay, so who is at risk? Okay, older people are at risk, particularly those who have some pre-existing pulmonary condition. Um, why? Because older people also have some inherent immune suppression generally. Um, but the other thing is, and people who are older, they have decreased mucociliary clearance. So actually the physical ability of the cilia to just push debris out and uh, promote its clearance really um, becomes a problem in terms of infection. People essential workers are at risk. But these people are unable to escape close contact. The other people who are, are at risk are the non-compliant. And we know that we have some people who just don't want to wear masks, they don't want to social distance, they're not washing their hands. However, just yesterday, I saw that there was a Norwegian study that if people maintained 100% compliance, there would be a 90% reduction in infection, okay? So non-compliance really makes a significant difference. The other thing um, that's recently come to light is that there are individuals who are genetically susceptible. So if we look uh, over here at these structural depictions, the ACE2 receptor, okay, and here's where it would bind to the coronavirus spike protein, okay, so here's a blow up of that area of the receptor binding domain, and then also the protease, it's also known to facilitate fusion. There are several areas where there are variants that are thought to predispose specific groups of individuals to these infections, okay? So there's an ACE2 polymorphism that's associated with cardiovascular and pulmonary conditions. Um, this alters the angiotensin ACE2 interaction and it's arginine 514 
that's predict that's uh, present in African and African American populations. Also, only the African and African American populations carry the variants three twenty three threonine and asparagine four twenty four to tyrosine. So that that variant, okay. And those respectively, in terms of their allele frequencies, are 0 0.003 and 0 0.01. 0 0.01 is pretty high, okay? There's another one, proline, proline 389 is actually occurs in that next group, okay? Uh, with an allele frequency of 0.015%. And 35% and 59% of deleterious variants that are present in the protease coded region are carried by the African uh, African American group and also the non Finnish, those of non Finnish European descent. Okay. Um, so not only are individuals there are individuals who may get, um, may have multiple of these things. They may be genetically susceptible because of their race. They may be essential workers and older. This compilation puts them at significantly higher risk. The other thing is people who are heavy, the people who are obese um, were more likely to die and also to be admitted to the ICU. And this was demonstrated in studies from China in the UK and also from the US. So what can we do about it, okay? Well, there's the opportunities for treatment by targeting the host or different host functions, okay? And it's been shown that when people are recovering from viral infections, have plasma that has antibodies, um, neutralizing antibodies, that are functional and can actually be used and taken from one person and given to another person. There are treatments that actually influence the levels of the receptor. Um, so in the context of cardiovascular therapy, that, that may play a role in terms of infectivity. Chloroquine and hydrochloroquine thus far don't appear to be, they're immunomodulatory, but don't appear, appear to be very effective. The other thing that can occur or that, that could happen is there can be antibodies generated directly target the spike protein. And where would these come from? They could come from adoptive transfer, like from the convalescent plasma. They could come, they could be developed because of vaccine um, and a vaccine response um, or recombinant monoclonal antibodies could actually be made, okay? The other thing is to be a protease inhibitor developed that would actually block and prevent the TPRSS2 from activating the spike protein. And there's been lots of success with protease inhibitors uh, in the context of HIV, for example, okay? Vaccinations will also allow the of CD8 positive T cells. Um, this would secrete cytotoxic granules and kill infected cells. And then the other thing that could occur is pro inflammatory cytokines can be neutralized through transfer of blocking antibodies or actually mechanically removing them from the blood. So those are things that could potentially be done um, targeting host functions. What about targeting viral functions, okay? And, you know, I'm here at USC. Ralph Barrick is a colleague over um, in, also in the Department of Micro and Immunology. And he discovered and helped develop remdesivir. And this is a broad spectrum antiviral prodrug that has potent antiviral activity against a number of RNA viruses. And so he'd been working with this pre-COVID-19 uh, and testing it against other coronaviruses. And this is an experiment did looking at the MERS um, coronavirus and demonstrating when you have, when you, this is a mouse experiment and these are mouse lungs. He infected this mouse with the MERS coronavirus. 
and you can actually see lots of the antigen there in the lungs. But with remdesivir treatment, those are almost clear. Okay. And how does this work? It's likely that this remdesivir causes premature termination of viral RNA transcription. Okay. Um, a number of antivirals work like that. Um, for example, acyclovir that targets the herpes viruses. And so this was a great candidate um, and moved into clinical trials. Uh, and this was one that was recently published in the New England Journal where they looked at remdesivir versus placebo. And you can see substantively more recoveries with remdesivir compared to placebo. There was a much shorter median time to recovery with remdesivir compared to placebo. And we actually looked at number of deaths by two weeks post infection, post treatment. You see the remdesivir is significantly lower deaths compared to 54 in the placebo. So vaccines. It appears a very promising vaccine strategy is that of the mRNA vaccine. And why would that be important? Um, it's important because post-translational modifications are critical. As I shared with you, when you actually look at the outside of the, of the virus, three of the structural proteins are glycoproteins, okay? They have post-translational modifications. So with an mRNA vaccine, it goes into the cell, actually produces viral antigen proteins in the cell that include natural host post-translational modifications. And then these proteins are released and exposed to the immune system, okay? So they're then, because it's not the full virus, it's just a piece of it that's, that the mRNA is targeted to, specifically the spike, okay? This is presented to antigen-presenting cells that then interface with T helper cells that provide B cell help and allow antibodies to be generated and also to stimulate cytotoxic T cell response and macrophages. So you're gonna get two things, both the naive B cell response and memory, uh, memory B, as well as T cell responses, okay? So what you first is there's a primary antigen challenge at time zero with any vaccine. And this is from the WHO vaccine basics course. There's a little bit of lag time and then you'll see a primary response, okay? And you see antibody levels increase and wane. And then around four to five weeks out, there's a secondary challenge and you get a much more robust secondary response and hopefully long-lived response. Okay. So there's really promising news because the first human phase one clinical trial um, has begun and there was an interim analysis that was just published over the past week or so. Okay. And basically what they're doing is they're making an mRNA vaccine against the SARS-CoV-2 utilizing an mRNA, the spike. It's packaged into a liposome, which helps facilitate its entry into cells. It is administered intradermally or intramuscularly, gets into the cell, undergoes those post-translational modifications we talked about, is presented by MHC. We now have this antigen uh, protein that allows antibody production and CTL responses. So in this Jennifer, case, we're about, this Jennifer, escalation, open level. Jennifer, we're about four minutes out. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to just really hurry up now uh, and skip. But bottom line is this vaccine looks really good. This first vaccination actually resulted in significant antibody responses, as you can see here, um, in this dose escalation. So it looks very, very promising.
let me just quickly skip to the oral stuff and the case for infection of the oral cavity. We see viral shedding highest during the early stages of disease, infection of the major and minor salivary glands. This can allow subsequent release of particles into the saliva. And the positive rate of in saliva can be up to 90%. Um, furin and other proteases are abundant in the mouth and oral hygiene can really provide a significant opportunity to decrease oral burden. The receptors are expressed at very high levels here, and there are also oral pathologies associated with this, including oral ulceration and blistering, as well as vesicular bullous lesions, as we see in other viral infections. Uh, and with regard to salivary gland infection, we see acute peritidis, uh, and that's been described uh, in, a, in a very small group of patients, okay? I'm going to just quickly skip through. Um, there is an opportunity in the oral cavity to diminish oral viral load utilizing oral rinses, including povidine iodine, iodine like betadine. Those products consistently demonstrate virucidal activity, as do hydrogen peroxide solutions at concentrations of 1.5 and 3%. Um, what we have an observational cohort study at UNC uh, that we've been working with. This is a longitudinal cohort study of ambulatory and hospitalized patients that's now enrolling. And from these patients, when we look at um, saliva at entry, versus one month out, we can see both, as we target both the E region and the RNA region with primers that we develop, we see it drops off pretty significantly. The important thing here is not only do we see the RNA go down, but in collaboration with biomedomics, we've been looking at salivary antigens in this point of care test, okay? And what you can see here this is a pre-COVID sample, no band. This is a post-COVID, this is a COVID sample. You can see a band here in the saliva. So this is a point of care test. It takes about 20 minutes. This is a significant opportunity for us. Uh, and I'll move to end here with our SWAT. So we've got right. strengths. Jennifer, thank you so much. That was an outstanding overview. We're at the top of the hour. Um, I know we're, um, some people may be uh, probably going to have to jump off of this. I've had questions about will the slides be available? I do believe these are all recorded. Um, all of these would be available. If you have questions, you know, we can take a couple uh, for people that can hang around, but we also have the uh, IDR uh, member discussion forum and Jennifer has agreed to answer questions through that venue as well. So if you have questions, um, please go ahead and go on the chat and Jennifer will be available to answer those as well. But again, thank you, uh, Jennifer, for an outstanding presentation and overview. It sounded to me like uh, we ought to be asking a uh, loss of sense of smell as opposed to where people have traveled. One, one question somebody asked was, um, you mentioned right there at the end about the uh, rinses with povidone iodine and uh, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, I know people have also asked about, there was one question specifically about saline. Any evidence that saline rinse does anything to reduce viral shed orally? Um, so I think the physical clearance of cells that may be infected, but um, there's no real hard evidence that saline does much in okay. terms of... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question was that you mentioned three countries uh, that didn't have anything reported, and there was a question about are they protected or something? Is just reporting, or what's the and what were the three countries, if you know? So they are in Asia. I can't tell. I don't know exactly which ones they are. I can point them out to you on the map. Don't know the names of them. One's in Africa, two in Asia, um, but I think that those are just they just haven't reported. Right. Yeah, and there was a question about could you provide the uh, Norwegian study reference, and that's again something we can do um, through the uh, IDR uh, member discussion forum and get additional information out. Uh, another question: What is the optimum time for initiation of the Vesivir therapy, and, and is there a disadvantage to that drug? 
So the optimal, the optimal time would be if you can capture someone when they're in an acute infection phase, um, because that's the time when you're having most viral replication. So that so if, if you can get it in there early, best. Okay, makes sense. Well, um, yeah, people also were asking about other uh, rinses like uh, CPC or chlorhexidine rinses. Any evidence about those? Chlorhexidine has not performed as well as these other two, and there hasn't been much done with CPC. Okay. Um, any other oxidizing compounds containing rinses that might be benefit? Potentially, you know? but I think there's a real opportunity. Actually, the studies need to be done. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, people are, are starting to drop off. We had a great attendance for this. I hope uh, folks uh, enjoyed that. I certainly did. And again, want to thank Jennifer for her efforts putting this forward and all that she's doing related to uh, pushing research and the agenda to try and keep everybody safe and healthy. And I hope everybody will join us again next Wednesday for the next in our uh, COVID ADR seminar series. So thank you. Please be safe. And thank you again so much, Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me. Everyone stay safe and be well.